5 p.m. CBS News. Israel's Prime Minister has put forth new conditions for conclusion of a further interim peace agreement with Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula. Direct negotiations. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting on the CBS radio network. The North have now dumped the docking module, which enabled them to perform the historic link-up in space with the Soviet Soyuz spaceship, and they've kicked their spacecraft into a slightly higher orbit, preparatory for return to Earth tomorrow. Earlier, they opened their last full day in space with a news conference with reporters on the ground, the first time there's ever been that kind of direct contact. They predicted that orbital flight by men and women will be somewhat routine, as they put it, as the space shuttle rocket plane era develops through the 1980s. Some buildings that need little maintenance. Clean! Today, for the first time, reporters were permitted to talk directly to the astronauts as they asked questions. One of the questions they asked was, what are the problems of living in space? Probably the, there's no one thing with any great difficulty. The, the one overall thing is the perpetual problem, as Tom said, is the housekeeping problems. So that's, again, the thing we've heard about from everybody that's ever flown, but you, can, you can't appreciate it until you're here. But everything that you drop floats off somewhere, and you've got to chase it, and uh, it seems to find the most hidden cranny to deposit itself in, and meals, which are a really mundane thing on Earth, with the same equipment up here, just take about three times as long to prepare, eat, dispose of. Other than that, uh, it's been super. Plus, we need a traffic cop up here to direct who's going to go through uh, which way and when. Seems like uh, we're always uh, bumping into each other and uh, trying to get into the same locker. And, uh, it's really a pretty small volume up here, so that, that all works together to sometimes uh, give minor frustration. Uh, we've had some long 16 hours days, one after another, maybe 16 plus quite a few hours, but uh, everything has gone off great and we feel in good shape. But uh, up working around in this little place with all this gear on board has really been a bear. The astronauts went on to say that the flight actually was very enjoyable. And Slayton said that physically he hadn't done anything that his 91-year-old aunt in Wisconsin couldn't have done. This was in contrast to Alexei Leonov, who said the cosmonauts have had a very difficult time of it. The USS New Orleans is on station tonight, ready for splashdown tomorrow afternoon. The astronauts will come down about 480 miles northwest of Hawaii. The rescue crews have completed their last rehearsal, and weather in the landing area is predicted to be good, with a few scattered clouds, light wind, and four-foot swells. NBC News will be on the air with live coverage beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Roy Neal at the NBC News Center, Mission Control, Houston. Astronauts of Apollo Soyuz preparing for their return to Earth tomorrow have jettisoned their docking module. That's the new piece of equipment which made possible their historic meeting in space with the two Soviet cosmonauts. Earlier in the day, the astronauts held a news conference, and Nelson Benton reports. It was not the garden variety news conference after peering into the upside down had to be reoriented to make the group picture a more conventional one. In the first such instance of reporters directly questioning by radio a space crew in flight, Commander Tom Stafford was asked had the flight been worth the time, the trouble, and the money. The, uh, was the mission worth the cost? Yes, I think definitely so. It did put together a new mechanism for both the countries, and they both contributed equally to it as far as rendezvous for rescue. And the main item that can show that, uh, in spite of great political differences, that uh, if people make commitments, that a lot of effort can be achieved. So I would say yes, it was certainly worth the effort on both sides. And as far as Glenn Lenny, a lot of us can see, uh, it cost him as much or more than it did us. About which problems have been the most worrisome ones, it is the lack of space in space flight. We need a traffic cop up here to direct who's going to go through uh, which way and when. Seems like uh, we're always uh, bumping into each other and uh, trying to get into the same locker. Slayton was grounded for years because his heart and official medical opinion had beat to different drummers. Now that you've had a chance actually to fly in a spacecraft after 16 years of waiting on the ground, was it uh, really worth it? It feels great. 
the only thing that upsets me is having missed all this fun for the last 16 years. In fact, every time we look out the window, it's kind of hard to believe. It's just, uh, just fantastic. Just from a physical point of view, I haven't done anything. Uh, my 91-year-old aunt up in Wisconsin uh, could have done equally well. NASA officials think Slayton's space flight should continue. They've offered him an executive job developing the manned space shuttle and say he'll be considered for a pilot slot when the shuttle starts space flights in 1979. Nelson Denton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. This is the world tonight. Good evening, I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. Cosmonauts Leonov and Kubasov were flown to Moscow today for a hero's reception. And tomorrow night at this time, the Apollo astronauts should be aboard their recovery ship in the Pacific to receive their hero's welcome. This afternoon, they sent their docking module spinning into space. And Reed Collins has more on their story from the CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Tonight, the Apollo is attempting to get the last possible use out of the docking module that made it possible to join the Soyuz spacecraft last week and interchange the crews. This exercise involved tracking the tumbling docking tube as it flipped along 186 miles out and measuring the slight dips and rises caused by variations in the Earth's gravity around the orbital track. Tomorrow, the Apollo and its crew surrender once more to gravity. They'll fire the service engine, discard the service module, and 41 minutes later be drifting down in a morning sky some 400 miles west of Hawaii. The recovery ship New Orleans is on station with its complement of recovery planes and helicopters there. And when those three main parachutes collapse on the blue waters, it will close out this mode of space travel for Americans. We plan to fly back to landing strips when the shuttle of the 1980s is operational. This last Apollo crew will be flown from Hawaii back to Houston, Texas, and in the near future as a world tour with the Soviet crew to reap the last drop of benefit from this heady mixture of Apollo's Soyuz detente. Mrs. Reed Collins, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. ABC News. the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell, and at this hour... CBS News. President Ford may offer Congress a new compromise plan to decontrol domestic oil prices. I'm Jerry Landay reporting on the CBS Radio Network. CBS News. The United Nations Security Council met tonight to consider extending the mandate for the Sinai Force. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Pronounce Thomas Stafford, Donald Slayton, and Vance Brand are getting ready to end their part of the American Soviet space mission. The three will speak to you the Nelson Bitten has a report from Houston. The Apollo astronauts have cleaned up the outside of their spacecraft, are packing up the inside for the final Apollo splashdown tomorrow in the Pacific. The crew ditched the docking module this afternoon, the tunnel that had connected them with the Soviet Soyuz. Most of their scientific projects in space are complete and are being stowed for the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, which is to occur in late afternoon. After an eight-hour rest due to begin just shortly, Stafford, Brand, and Slayton will start tuning Apollo for splashdown near the recovery ship New Orleans, some 320 miles west of Pearl Harbor. Weather in the landing area is forecast to be slightly cloudy skies, mild seas, good visibility, described by NASA officials as just great. Nelson Benton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Engel, and at this hour, the crew may have discovered a new star well beyond our own solar system. The astronauts located the object with an ultraviolet telescope they used in scientific experiments. The new discovery, described as fiery, very intense, very compact, its origin unknown. The crew returns to Earth tomorrow, bringing the era of Apollo to a close. The recovery carrier in New Orleans is standing by about 300 miles west of Hawaii, where the weather is described as excellent. has been made to end the hemispheric isolation of Cuba. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network.
We return to Earth tomorrow morning, and we'll have live coverage of that, but it's not yet clear whether the remaining Soyuz crew will land tomorrow or not. Still no word on the rumored touchdown of the Soviet salute crew, and it has been rumored that the Soviets would split the world headline between a final splashdown tomorrow afternoon and the touchdown of the two-man crew that has been in the Soviet space station for two months. Meanwhile, astronauts Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Brown continued on with another four day of experiments, including an attempt to find gravitational hotspots on Earth by bouncing radio waves off the docking module, which has been ejected from the Apollo spacecraft. David Crane, KGRH News. the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell and at this hour, thoughts have just bedded down for their last night in space, but just before they turned in, they spotted something over the Aleutian Island chain of Alaska. Apollo Commander Tom Stafford described it. We just saw what we think is a possible volcano. I don't know if you've got any operating down there or not, but it was about 207, it was 18, 19. Let's make every mile count. With a large stream of uh, gray-brown smoke going down the stream uh, mixed with uh, white. All I could interpret it would be a volcano. If not, it was really a horrendous oil fire. Those numbers Stafford reeled off were the specific times that showed up on their space clock when they saw the explosion. By giving the time down to the second, controllers on the ground can find out what they saw. Ultraviolet rays aloft that have some Earth scientists rather excited. The preliminary data indicating that the experiment may have opened the way to determining more about how stars are born, the celestial kind. And late into its flight, the Apollo found that cosmonauts Leonov and Kubasov had left on board the Apollo four tape cassettes belonging to the Soviet spacecraft. Houston's mission control has advised Moscow the cassettes will be returned when Apollo gets home. Nelson Benton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. Soviet cosmonauts Leonov and Kubasov, who came down earlier this week, met with reporters today, and Leonov said the joint mission went as smoothly as a sealed egg. See today, July the 24th, 75, exactly 16 after 7 is KGRH time. And here is Ken Krinsky to continue morning news. Thank you, Bill. Apollo astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton are scheduled to splash down in the Pacific Ocean, 345 miles west of Honolulu, at 418 Houston time this afternoon. The crew will be awakened in just a few minutes to begin preparations for the return to Earth. Live coverage of the splashdown will be provided on the KTRH Evening Report from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston with news reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. Meanwhile, the Soyuz cosmonauts are conducting a news conference this morning in the Soviet Union, and Crane will have a report on it during the 7.30 News with Ben Baldwin. Good morning, Jets. Party's over. Time to come home. Tom Stafford, you really know how to wake somebody up, don't you? And by the way, Harry, uh, would redneck mother uh, translate into Russian any better than hello, darling? Uh, not much better at all, David. I'm afraid uh, that's not going to be one of the functions of detente, fortunately. <laughs> David, in the news conference today, prior to the question and answer period, the Moscow press conference heard reports from Vladimir Kachelnikov, acting president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Konstantin Bushuyev, head of the Soviet side of ASDP, and General Vladimir Shatalov, head of the Cosmonaut Training Program, in addition to hearing from newly promoted Major General Alexei Leonov and Flight Engineer Valery Kubasov. In the remarks and in the answers to questions asked of them, the Soviet cosmonauts expressed confidence that the social and political differences between the USSR and the United States would not constitute an obstacle to further cooperation between the two countries in a number of fields. They had warm praise for the American people and look forward to the reduction of international tension and the end of the arms race. And still no comment uh, on the salute crew? Uh, no public comment yet about when they'll be down. And we were looking at this the other day. They've been up now some two months. That was their expected uh, stay time. Uh, stay time. And uh, there was an indication that perhaps they would come back uh, today and share world headlines with the Apollo splashdown. Splashdown.
down, still on now for, according to Flight Director Don Putty, at 420 this afternoon, about 420, some 300 to 280 miles west of Hawaii in the Pacific, and the weather conditions there are reported ideal. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. Clock. This portion of the KTRH Morning Report is brought to you by Farm and Home Savings Association, where current assets are more than $1 billion. Savings are insured to $40,000 with the FSLIC. Time for news. Here's Joe Copper. Thank you, Bill. There will be some tears and a lot of memories and not a few dreams when the Apollo spacecraft splashes down in the Pacific. But most of all, there will be the proud record of accomplishment which took men to the moon, moon rocks to the earth, created a world of new technology, and forced an attitude of globalism never before perceived by those whose perspective was limited to earthbound views. Many in Houston hold memories of the days when Manned Spacecraft Center was scattered in assorted warehouses and old office buildings around the area. And when will we beat the Russians to the moon was the obligatory question at most news conferences. Well, the Apollo program comes to an end. When American astronauts head into space again, it will be on a space shuttle. The cosmonauts of the ASTP have already landed and have had their press conference. Here's a late report from David Crane. And that news conference this morning was at 4 o'clock a local time, noon Moscow time. Harry Walsh and I were sitting here monitoring that discussion. And uh, a two-hour and ten-minute session, Harry, and uh, I think there was a, a many of the comments could have been expected. Yes, David, prior to the question and answer period, the Moscow press conference had reports from uh, Vladimir Katyalnikov, who is acting president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, from Konstantin Bushuyev, the head of the Soviet side of ASTP, General Vladimir Shatalov, head of the Cosmonaut Training Program, and from newly promoted Major General Alexei Leonov and Flight Engineer Valery Kubasov. In their remarks and uh, in the answers to questions asked of them, the Soviet cosmonauts expressed confidence that the social and political differences between the USSR and the United States would not constitute uh, an obstacle to further cooperation between the two countries in a number of fields. They had warm praise for the American people and looked forward to the reduction of international tension and the end of the arms race. And uh, Leonov also revealed in the conference that he and Kubasa played a practical joke on the American guests in the Soyuz spacecraft by offering them small bottles with vodka labels, which in fact contain borscht. Borscht. It's not quite like vodka. Slight different. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, there was another foul-up uh, that was uh, reported on. It seems as if uh, Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Grant, in preparing for their splashdown today, uh, were doing a little house cleaning, and they found some uh, tapes that they didn't know they had, and they were some Russian tapes that the cosmonauts had left for the Apollo Command Module. And uh, from what I understand, uh, Flight Director Don Putty says, and Don is standing right here, those will be sent back, right? Yes, they were requested. Oh, they, they, rec they found out they did not have them. Is that it, Don? And they're going, <laughs> okay. But that, that will be taken care of. No international incident there. We're still looking uh, at what is going to happen to the Salute crew, the two cosmonauts that have been um, in the Soviet space station now for some two months. A touchdown had been expected for that crew yesterday, or it still could come today. And the Soviets are not the same at this time. Uh, there had been a request here or a query along the lines of, if it is today, will you provide audio and television coverage as um, you did last Monday? And the comment was, we don't know if it's coming down and we don't know if we will do that or not. But it uh, is expected to happen today or tomorrow, and I think that would be quite a propaganda coup right there here. Just uh, sharing, sharing the world headlines with the Apollo splashdown. And that splashdown now on for about 4.20 this afternoon, about uh, 280 miles west of Hawaii. Weather conditions there reported ideal, partly cloudy skies, winds at about 15 knots. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. Down in the Pacific this afternoon, ending the flight that linked them with the Russian cosmonauts, and also ending all U.S. space flights at least until 1979, and possibly after that when the U.S. space shuttle program begins. NBC News will, of course, cover the Apollo splashdown live on radio and television. Television time begins at 5 o'clock Eastern Time and 4 p.m. in the afternoon Central Time. Uncertainty still clouds the prospects for an interim Sinai agreement between Israel and Egypt. 
This is Dallas Townsend reporting on the CBS radio network. They're scheduled to splash down in the Pacific, 200 miles west of Hawaii, at 5.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The ground communicator, when he awakened the astronauts this morning, said, the party's over and it's time to come home. Now this message. American Information Radio. This is John Grimes, and at this hour, space for at least four years. The Apollo Trio is busy getting ready for splashdown in the Pacific this afternoon. Stafford, Clayton, and Brand awoke to a current country music favorite radio from Houston this morning, Redneck Mother. in Apollo's Doyuz News Center. With less than six and one half hours to splash down, the astronauts are busy preparing for the deorbit burn, a burn that will kick their spaceship out of orbit and into the Earth's atmosphere at white-hot speed. Flight Director Don Putty reflected this morning on the past nine days. We're approaching the end of what I consider to be a, a highly successful mission, and I think it proved to us the feasibility of cooperative space ventures. Secondly, it's more or less the end of one era of manned space flight and the beginning of another. But he said the weather in the splashdown area is perfect. Bill Larson, Apollo Soyuz News Center. Your live coverage of splashdown and recovery beginning at 5.06 Eastern, 2.06 Pacific time over many of these information network stations. Apollo astronauts splash down in the Pacific today, and after that, there won't be any more Americans in space for at least four years when the space shuttle is put up. Astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton are due to come down at about 5.20 this afternoon, Eastern Time. CBS News live coverage starting at 5 p.m. The two astronauts who linked up with the astronauts in space, Alexei Leonov on the left and Valery Kubasov, met with newsmen in Moscow this morning. Leonov wished the astronauts good luck for their splashdown and said everything went as smooth as peeled eggs in space. Kubasov agreed, but said there were some minor difficulties, such as a swaying of the Soyuz during one of the link-ups. Nothing serious, though. To delay action in the six-month extension of oil price controls vetoed by President Ford. I'm Richard C. Hartlett, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. We're on the midday report from CBS News. The United Nations Security Council has postponed the meeting to approve the extension of the UN mandate in the Sinai. I'm Douglas Edwards, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Astronauts interrupted the preparations for landing today to take pictures of a developing tropical storm in the Atlantic. They're due to splash down in the Pacific this afternoon. The era comes to an end today when astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton splash down in the Pacific Ocean at 4.20 Houston time this afternoon. KTRH will provide live coverage from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston on the evening report. We now have this live report from the JSC with KTRH News reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. At 4 o'clock this morning, Houston time, a conference was held in Moscow with the ASTP the cosmonauts. The conference was attended by some 400 members of the media, and from what we were told, that's all they could get into the room. Another two to 300 waited outside. The conference lasted for two hours, ten minutes. Harry Walsh has a summation. David, the uh, reports were read, or speeches were given prior to the question and answer period by a number of dignitaries in the Soviet space program, including Vladimir Kachelnikov, acting president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Konstantin Bushuyev, head of the Soviet side of the ASTP mission, General Vladimir Shatalov, who is the head of the cosmonaut training program, 
and also by newly promoted Major General Alexei Leonov and Flight Engineer Valery Kupasov. In their remarks and in the answers to the questions that were asked of them, the Soviet cosmonauts expressed confidence that social and political differences between the USSR and the United States will not constitute a uh, serious obstacle to further cooperation between the two countries in space and a number of related fields. They had warm praise for the American people, and they looked forward to reduction of international tension and the end of the arms race. And meanwhile, still no word on the uh, Salute crew, the two Russian cosmonauts who have now spent 61 days in the Soviet space station. There had been a great deal of speculation that the cosmonauts would either come down yesterday or perhaps today and share the world headlines with a touchdown splashdown day. That apparently will not be the case now. We've been waiting for word throughout the morning. It has not come through, uh, at least at this time as far as we know. And it, uh, it is now too late for a touchdown in the Soviet Union, so we're probably looking at some time tomorrow or 62 days, which would be a new record in space uh, for the Russians. The previous uh, longest day was some 24 days. Meanwhile, all continues to go well with Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Brown. The Apollo astronauts have spent the morning uh, completing uh, many, many more experiments. Within the hour, though, everything will be tucked away and prepared for splashdown. The deorbit burn will be done at about 1.38 this afternoon. Splashdown now scheduled at 4.19 this afternoon, some 300 miles west of Hawaii. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. No time for nostalgia for the Johnson Space Center flight control teams. I'm David Crane. Details in a moment. Don Putty is one of three flight control directors of the three flight control teams here at the Johnson Space Center that work in rotating ships. After this mission, the end of Apollo, it's going to be a long four years until the space shuttle uh, manned space flights begin. A four-year break, though, for the flight control teams is not in the making. Don Putty has talked about uh, some of his crew members leaving the late night shift this morning and going immediately to shuttle briefings. The party was also getting together with some of the other flight control directors and looking at the number of man hours that have gone into the manned space flights. We just did some rough calculations. Uh, what we did was uh, just made up a little chart of the various flights that uh, uh, have occurred since the manned space flight program began. And uh, we obtained uh, from the individuals that were present in the control center on two of the teams uh, the flights that they had participated in. Uh, we still have operators in the control center right now uh, who were on the initial Mercury flights. Uh, I can't testify that the calculations that we made are uh, accurate uh, to say within plus or minus five to ten percent. However, uh, what we came up with was somewhere around uh, 36 to 42 man years worth of total experience on the console monitoring uh, manned spacecraft in orbit. For the 40 years of man hours, service will not be wasted. Those teams will stay together and continue working on the uh, shuttle program now, preparing for it. And also, most of the other employees out here will remain uh, with JSE involved in the shuttle program. John McLeish, the public information officer, says he expects very few people to be laid off, if any. This is David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. Hockey news time. News of the hour, on the hour, from American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour, he is in final preparations now for a Pacific splashdown this afternoon. Live coverage begins at 5.06 p.m. Eastern Time over many of these information network stations. PM. PBS News. The Soviet Union has increased this year's grain purchases with another one million tons from Canada, an agriculture department official say. The Russians may be forced into even more purchases because of a bad crop situation. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network. So now the Apollo astronauts are scheduled to splash down in the Pacific Ocean, 320 miles west of Hawaii. 
The primary recovery ship, the USS New Orleans, is standing by, ready for the pickup, which will end the Apollo era of space exploration. The next American astronaut to go into space will be aboard the space shuttle in 1979. Wait. p.m. CBS News. Splashdown for the Apollo astronauts is little more than an hour away now. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting on the CBS radio network. Soon, the crew will fire the engine of their capsule for a few seconds, starting the spaceship into its slow dive back through the atmosphere into its landing in the Pacific about 320 miles west of Hawaii. The weather in the landing zone, according to NASA's Bob Crippen, is just fine. The weather out there at your recovery point is still super. It's uh, once more 1,800 scattered, 10 miles fizz, winds out of the east about 15 knots with wave heights, uh, 4 feet may even be less. Looks like they're declining a little bit. Should have a, a super landing. With today's splashdown, both the history-making Apollo Soyuz flight and the Apollo program itself come to an end. The next U.S. manned space flight now scheduled will involve the space shuttle program, which begins in 1979. In Moscow today, the Soviet cosmonauts who landed several days ago held a news conference. They said there were several minor glitches during the joint flight, but generally everything went as smooth as peeled eggs. The cosmonauts added the only thing they needed to make it perfect would have been the presence of Gina Lola Brigida. More CBS News after this. Yeah. CBS News. Apollo on the way back to Earth. I'm Douglas Edwards, reporting on the CBS radio network, and switching now to CBS News Space Headquarters in New York and Reed Collins. Twenty-three minutes and hundreds of miles ago, the service engine braked for seven seconds, putting the Apollo on a collision course with the Earth's atmosphere. And just two minutes ago, the Apollo began scooping its way into the molecules of air at the top of our ocean of air. The craft is dipping down now, blunt end forward, starting to glow, heading for the blackout period when no communication gets in or out of it. It has passed over the New Hebrides Islands of the Pacific, heading toward the spot 300 miles west of Hawaii, where the prime recovery ship New Orleans is waiting. Twenty minutes more and Apollo should be home. And in it, the 41st, 42nd, and 43rd Americans to step into space. Mission Control and the Soviet Center of Kaliningrad has notified Houston it is awake and listening and wishing all the best for the last returning half of Apollo Soyuz. Reed Collins, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. Reed Collins will be back for a splashdown in a few minutes. There's a meeting in space. I'm Reed Collins at CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Soyuz, of course, has met. It has returned, and now Apollo is coming home to a point some 320 miles west of Hawaii, where the U.S. helicopter landing craft is waiting for it, and where, in fact, it can be sighted now. Uh, just a few moments ago, after radar contact was made, the returning spacecraft has been sighted by the men aboard that vessel. Let's go out to our newsman there and Tom Shell. Yeah, the two stars... Uh, are separating, slowing it down now. It looks like we've got three good umbrellas. There they are, and it has really slowed that Apollo down now as the astronauts Tom Stafford, Deke Clayton, and Vance Brand are just about home. They are due to splash down at 19 minutes and 51 seconds past the hour. And it has really slowed it down now, and the Apollo starts to swing back and forth like a pendulum under those big three orange and white uh, parachutes. We can see the sun reflecting off of it, and then as it gets out of the sun's rays, uh, shaded by the uh, parachutes or the angle away from us, we uh, cannot see it reflecting off. But those shoots are there. It seems to almost uh, just hang uh, in the air. It looks like it's hardly dropping at all compared to what we saw when we had the uh, drogue shoot out because it was really floating toward the water with the drogue, uh, just the drogue out. But that drogue slows it down enough that when the three main parachutes come out, they won't be uh, torn away by the impact. The drogue is a much smaller parachute. First, an apex cover blows off the top to allow the drogue to go out. Then, that apex uh, cover goes circling toward the Earth at the speed that the uh, Apollo was dropping. But it is a beautiful sight out here, looking back against some wispy clouds far off on the horizon, the beautiful dark blue waters of the Pacific Ocean, and a very, very light blue uh, sky. We have a bright sun overhead, and there are no clouds at all in the recovery area. 
The recovery helicopters are all out. There are five of them out on this mission. There's the uh, main recovery helicopter that will be moving in over the command module at just about the time it hits the water. But Captain Ralph E. Niger of the USS New Orleans has the ship headed directly toward the command module. He had said that he hoped to be four miles away at splashdown, and it looks as though we are just about on the mark. We are tracking right in toward the command module. A beautiful sight with those uh, big three uh, umbrellas up there uh, hanging above the command module. So we're just a few minutes to slice down. This is Tom Shell aboard the USS New Orleans. And back at Space Headquarters in New York, we'll be listening now to some of the um, information we may be getting through Mission Control. There's a little bit of the communication that is possible with the, through the five helicopters that are out whirling around the descending series of chutes. They sometimes get some communication uh, that is not really available to people on the helicopter landing craft itself, the USS New Orleans. Mission Control in Kaliningrad in the Soviet Union notified Houston's Mission Control that it was up, that is, it was awake and it was listening, and uh, they sent their best wishes for a happy landing to the returning half of the Apollo Soyuz mission. Tom Stafford was heard to say a few moments ago, before we took air, that uh, they could actually feel the shoots as they uh, came out. Let's go back to the uh, New Orleans. For a second, there it is. Flight down, and astronaut Stafford, Clayton, and Brand are home. As the command module has hit the Pacific, and we're waiting to see at what time it came down. It was due at 1951, and we'll wait for uh, just what happened, but we're here now 21 seconds early. So, instead of the 1951, they got home a little early. But that time was uh, almost two minutes behind what had been planned when they uh, blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center some nine days ago. So they are stable two. They are stable two. That means they're upside down in the water. No problem there because there are uh, big balloons on the uh, the top, or now the bottom of the command module since it's upside down. But those balloons will be inflated, and then they will be enough to right the command module. If they do not work, the recovery helicopter in the area has a winch. They can drop that in. They get a hook on when the swimmers go in the water, and the uh, helicopter will then right the command module. In 5.2 miles, we are 5.2 miles from the command module, and the command module is floating uh, as though the uh, cone were the bottom, so it is not directly upside down, and the heat shield is on top, and it looks uh, more like a like a, an antenna or a, uh, a dish that you would be uh, beeping out signals with. But it is uh, now it is now moving around, just bobbing in the water, upside down. There's no communications with the men inside now because the antennas are underwater. But the swimmers will be being deployed after the uh, command module writes itself. But it is now still upside down. It looks like it's beginning to turn over. We're waiting for those balloons. Uh, to uh, inflate. They are at the point of the uh, cone of the uh, command module. So we're waiting now, and uh, this generally takes uh, a little while, a few minutes, for the uh, for the balloon to inflate and get it lighted. This thing weighs uh, six tons, so it's quite a heavy uh, quite a heavy spaceship. This is Tom Shell aboard the USS New Orleans. And back at our space headquarters in New York, we are awaiting the uh, writing of the uh, spacecraft. Also, it's uh, it's possible that um, something could go wrong and they would be unable to inflate these big balloons that are supposed to put it back in the stable one or blunt end down in the ocean where it's, where it's designed to float. Men are not having a very happy time now. They're actually hanging a little bit in their harnesses and uh, looking downward. They can't see very much except maybe a little water sloshing around the hatch window. I'm going to bring up what is um, not really communication, but just background sound. That this is material that's being filtered through the the New Orleans from several of the um, crews that are in the air. They're hovering over. The communication isn't too good. But I believe that they have had some inkling, a better view at least than anybody else, of the spacecraft, and uh, they can tell you a little bit better. And they seem not to be terribly worried about things. As we hear, the swimmers are in the water, and they're working their way over toward the returned Apollo, whose writing apparatus is working. We see balloons on mission control monitor now, and the spacecraft is beginning to come around in the right fashion. 
and beginning to float like the rather ungainly truncated cone which it is. Perhaps we could go back to the New Orleans now and Tom Shell, who can describe more for us. The command module, and we can see the bags uh, inflating. There are two of them there that uh, appear to be inflated, and it is now flipping over, and there it is. It is now stable one. So the command module is stable one, and they will be able to have radio contact now with astronaut Stafford, Slayton, and Brand. And we imagine Commander Stafford will be talking to the recovery helicopter and uh, telling uh, pilot Gene Pellerin just exactly what the situation is in there after this upside-down landing. The crew of the recovery helicopter is uh, Gene Pellerin from St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, co-pilot is Lieutenant J.G. John Thompson. We asked Commander Pellerin about his job now. We use the uh, 10 and 10 technique, which is a 10-foot uh, hover. Well, we listened to some of that. We can tell you that Tom Stafford has communicated back through the, uh, the uh, helicopter. We can hear him now a little bit. Um, and he seems to be reporting that uh, things are all right inside. Well, we're hearing his circuit breakers are open. They're kind of going through a, a post-landing checklist, actually, inside there. And what we're hearing is actually conversation from inside the spacecraft itself as the three men go through the post-landing checklist and they're trying to get everything configured uh, in order for the spacecraft safely to be taken aboard the New Orleans. And some more hash, uh, some green landing dye has floated way out of the way with the current away from the, the craft itself, which is floating along right side up now, burnished almost a... A silver bronze, it looks like, having come back through the tremendous searing effects of the atmosphere that threatens things coming to us and keeps all of us so much alive here. The protective envelope in which people are born and survive and which they must return to, which these men have. Let's go back now aboard the New Orleans. Perhaps we can pick up some more conversation. Hi, the USS New Orleans. As the swimmers have not yet deployed to install the sea anchor to slow down the drift or the uh, flotation collar, a big rubber ring that stabilizes the uh, uh, spaceship as it floats in the water. It's a lousy float. Uh, as the astronauts have uh, described it, it just is not meant to float on the water uh, for very, very long. But we've got no reports of any sea sickness or anything. We have very, very calm seas here today, just about 3 foot 12. So we'll be waiting for the deployment of uh, the swimmers. But that will probably take a while while we're waiting for the uh, astronauts to continue their work on the inside. They've got a lot of equipment that has to be turned off. The equipment, when they were out in space, of course, has been stowed. And uh, now they will have to unstow some of the gear that they will be bringing out with them when they are picked across, uh, uh, picked up by the New Orleans. So now the recovery helicopter with Commander Gene Cullerin at the controls is now moving forward. The command module, and there go the swimmers. And those uh, sw first two swimmers out are Lieutenant Thomas Cleahammer of Detroit, Michigan, and uh, uh, Chief Boson's mate Ted Cassett of Spokane, Washington. We asked Tom Cleahammer just what his job is right now. I uh, swim around the module looking for leaks, detect leaks that may have occurred during the impact of the module with the water. Chief Cass uh, swims around to the other side and attached to the sea anchor, which is a triple parachute and slows down the module transit through the water. Enough so that the swimmers don't have any trouble working around the module. And we will be having two more swimmers going into the water with the uh, collar pretty soon. That's the flotation collar that helps to stabilize it. But right now, Clee Hammer and Chief Casa are uh, checking over All these. right, and we're listening as we uh, discuss the situation with the return to Apollo spacecraft, which is bobbing along on a very quiet Pacific Ocean about 320 miles west of Hawaii, awaiting the winching aboard the USS New Orleans. The Apollo came down wrong side up. The nitrogen-filled balloons on in the small end of the cone were inflated, and uh, they seemed to work fine, and they got it right side up. Continue there. We'll be uh, listening to Mission Control in Houston as they explain to us um, what they're getting. They get a little better information sometimes directly than the carrier itself does. All aboard seem to be well. We listened as uh, Tom Stafford and his fellow crew members went through some of the post-landing checklists. Uh, 
uh, closing circuit breakers and changing things so that they can safely be picked up. Helicopters working their way around out there. It's 11.30 local time. That is uh, almost noon in the Pacific point where they have landed. Sun is high overhead. There are no clouds in the sky. The Soviet uh, listener may have, um, and viewer, when he views it, may sort of wonder, well, why do those crazy Americans want to land in all that water? A lot of uh, Americans wondered probably the same thing when Pump down came of Soyuz in a cloud of dust and a hearty cry of ouch. And you wondered, why do those crazy Russians want to land on land? Well, it was two systems, of course. Both of them worked. Uh, people hadn't gotten lost in, in either one. They own more land, and uh, we think there's a lot more water on Earth, and so the two systems were devised a little differently. Happily, with a uniform and a Soyuz result, that is the joining of the fact that everybody seems to get back in one piece. So, everyone has gotten back from Apollo Soyuz safely. The process concedes now of getting the Apollo spacecraft aboard the helicopter landing vessel the one in. All three men are well. Continuing coverage of Apollo Soyuz, this meeting in space. This is Reed Collins, CBS News Space Headquarters, New York. CBS News. The last Apollo flight has come to an end with the safe and perfect splashdown of the capsule and the three astronauts in the Pacific. Tom Stafford, Vance Brand, and Deke Slayton guided their Apollo spacecraft to a space safe splashdown about 300 miles from Hawaii on a beautiful day. It was a beautiful job. I'm Christopher Glenn at CBS News, and Rick Collins reports from CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Service engine fired for seven seconds, committing the spacecraft to a collision with the Earth's atmosphere 20 minutes later. It fell toward a midpoint in the Pacific west of Hawaii, repeating the old pattern, converting the energy of speed to that of heat, and burning off 18,000 miles an hour to a plodding 300 miles an hour. The parachutes took over from there in series, and finally, under a cloudless sky, Apollo was floating downward at just 22 miles an hour within range of view of the recovery ship, the USS New Orleans. The spacecraft turned over when it hit, nose down, and floated that way until airbags were inflated and it righted itself. An open microphone in the craft made communication impossible for a time. Only the voices of Stafford, Slayton, and Brand going through the post-landing checklist told the recovery crews and mission control that all was well inside and the final spacecraft in the series had done its job. The New Orleans approached, threw a line to the swimmers, and Apollo was winched aboard. President Ford prepares his personal message to this last crew of Apollo. Reed Collins, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. In Moscow today, the Soviet cosmonauts who participated in the joint flight held a news conference. They admitted there had been a few minor ditches during the mission, but said, generally speaking, that everything went as smooth as peeled eggs. More news in a minute. Made a successful splashdown, ending the joint American-Russian space mission. We get the latest from David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. The Apollo astronauts are now safely aboard the prime recovery ship, the USS New Orleans. We're going to be having some comments from Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, Vance Brand, and just about 30 seconds or so. These are welcome aboard remarks. By Rear Admiral Ralph S. Wentworth, who is the commander of Task Force.
Space Center, the uh, return of the Apollo astronauts to the uh, the aircraft carrier, the New Orleans. This is the world tonight. I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. Tom Stafford, Vance Brand, and Deke Slayton guided their Apollo spacecraft to a safe splashdown today, about 300 miles from Hawaii. A beautiful day, a beautiful job. And Reed Collins reports now from CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. The service engine breaks the speeding Apollo over the Indian Ocean, making an appointment for impact with the Earth's atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. 322 miles west of Hawaii, the recovery ship New Orleans had five helicopters in the air and a full head of steam, ready to make for the descending spacecraft as fast as possible. The heat shield, like a massive brake lining, converted the 18,000 mile an hour speed to 300 miles per hour, and the parachute system began deploying. At 22,000 feet, the command module began filling mysteriously with smoke, alarming the astronauts, but not harming them. They flashed into the Pacific within sight of the carrier and turned blunt end up. The airbag system finally righted the spacecraft. The carrier winched it aboard, and three astronauts stepped out on the decks to receive the greeting of their president by telephone. Fourteen million of them. Congratulations and thanks for a very successful and extremely productive flight in space. Reed Collins, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. Morning. ABC News is. This is George Engel, and at this hour, the age of Apollo is over. The crewmen of the final Apollo mission, Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Brand, splashed down in the Pacific today after 10 days in orbit and the first joint U.S.-Soviet mission. After the astronauts were aboard the recovery ship New Orleans, west of Hawaii, President Ford phoned them to offer his congratulations. The President told the astronauts, As you know better than all of us, your particular flight also adds a new dimension that of international cooperation, and that is extremely vital now and in the days ahead. And I understand from the technicians that your new docking system uh, offers a foundation on which to build a future cooperative efforts that in the next decade could be a very valuable tool for space rescue. President Ford was offered a trip in space himself by the astronauts once the space shuttle program gets underway. No arms for Turkey. That story coming up. CBS News. The House has refused by 17 votes to partially lift the arms ban against Turkey. I'm Gary Landay reporting on the CBS radio network. The vote... This is George Engel for American Information Radio with World Wrap-Up. The sounds of the news this July 24th, 1975. In the top of the news, the end of the final Apollo mission. There it is, flashdown, and astronaut Stafford, Slayton, and Brand are home. A presidential compromise plan on energy ready for Congress, and the House votes against lifting the ban on arms to Turkey. 
We'll have those and other stories in a moment. Astronaut Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, and Vance Brad are taking a leisurely ocean voyage to Hawaii. The Apollo crewmen returned from their mission late this afternoon, and ABC's Tom Schell watched the final moments of their flight from the recovery ship New Orleans. The command module is just about on the water. We are waiting now. It's at about 600 feet altitude, dropping now toward the water. And we have those three big uh, parachutes throwing the drop to 32 feet per second. There it is. Flash down. And astronaut Stafford, Slayton, and Brand are home. The astronauts were brought safely aboard the New Orleans, and Tom Stafford called the recovery a great ending to the Apollo project. President Ford put in a phone call to the spacemen and told them, As you know better than all of us, your particular flight also has a new dimension, that of international cooperation, and that is extremely vital now and in the days ahead. President Ford said the docking system used by the astronauts to join up with Soyuz is a foundation for future cooperative space efforts and a potentially valuable tool for space rescue. CBS News. The Senate has passed the Voting Rights Act. I'm Jerry Landay, reporting on the CBS radio network. So the last Apollo flight are spending the night aboard the aircraft carrier New Orleans in the Pacific. They arrive in Hawaii tomorrow. Their successful 10-day mission in space drew high praise from President Ford. He said the joint mission had opened a new era of international cooperation. CBS News. The Senate late Thursday evening approved an extension of the voting rights law of 1965. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Now to aboard the recovery ship USS New Orleans after a successful splashdown in the Pacific Thursday afternoon. Thomas Stafford, Donald Slayton, and Vance Brand ended their historic nine-day flight, including the first joint space experiment for the Soviet Union. The end of this flight also marks the end of the Apollo era. Americans will not return to space for at least four years. When they do, it'll be in a revolutionary rocket plane known as the Space Shuttle. Donald Slayton have returned to Earth, but they're still traveling. The Spaceman Trio aboard the carrier USS New Orleans is steaming towards Pearl Harbor after a flawless descent and splash down in the Pacific several hundred miles west of Hawaii. The New Orleans is due at Pearl Harbor about 2.15 tomorrow afternoon, not long afterward. The astronauts again will take to the air, this time aboard a nonstop jet en route to Ellington Air Force Base near the Houston Space Center and a welcome home. A lavish ceremony for the Soyuz Apollo mission heroes is set for 9 o'clock our time Saturday morning, and the public is invited. From CBS News, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger defended President Ford's decision to go to Helsinki in a wide-ranging news conference today. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network that the three Apollo astronauts suffered no ill effects from fumes which filled their cabin during splashdown yesterday. Doctors aboard the recovery ship were keeping a close watch on the three to make sure they suffered no lung damage. Space agency officials are unsure what caused the fumes. The recovery ship is due to dock in Hawaii in about two hours. I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. CBS News. President Ford has defended the Helsinki trip and Secretary Kissinger has warned Russia over Portugal. I am Reed Collins reporting on the CBS radio network. CBS News. Turkey orders the U.S. to stop operations in some 20 bases on Turkish soil. The Turks will assume full control of the bases starting tomorrow. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network. This is The World Tonight. Good evening, I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. ...have been hospitalized at the Tripler Army Medical Center following their arrival in Honolulu aboard the recovery ship New Orleans. Doctors said the three complained of chest irritation after gas entered their command module during its descent into the Pacific yesterday. The so far unidentified gas caused the astronauts to put on oxygen masks, and NASA officials said Brand passed out for about one minute until the other two astronauts adjusted his mask. Space agency officials said the 
astronauts are in no immediate danger, though x-rays confirm they have lung irritation. Shortly after the New Orleans dock, the three walked down the gangway of the ship, smiling and waving at a crowd on the pier, then boarded Navy sedans for the trip to the hospital. There was no immediate word as to how long they would be there, though a welcoming ceremony scheduled later in the day was canceled. David Dow, CBS News, Honolulu. Calls from fumes that leaked into their spacecraft cabin just prior to yesterday's flashdown. Vance Brand reportedly passed out for about a minute. Flight surgeon Jerry Ordensky here at the Johnson Space Center says there is no cause for alarm, however. He said the crew spent a good night but complained of chest pains this morning. The fumes have still not been positively identified but could be nitrogen tetroxide control rocket propellant. A spokesman aboard the recovery ship said, though, a thorough inspection of the spacecraft indicated the fumes did not come from that potentially dangerous fuel. The crew entered the hospital wearing legs and smiling. Stafford said to tell the wives are feeling pretty good. The crew had been scheduled to return to Houston tomorrow morning. An official at the Johnson Space Center says the crew's return will now depend on when doctors release them from the hospital. That decision will be made after the 24-hour hold period at the Triplet Army Hospital in Hawaii. David Crane, KTRH News. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Dan Streeter, and at this hour, Brand and Slayton will spend the weekend under observation at Tripler Army Hospital in Honolulu. Doctors want to know if the American team from the joint U.S.-Soviet space mission suffered any lasting harmful effects from the mysterious fumes they inhaled as the Apollo made its specific splashdown. Dr. Charles Lapetta, who was the head of the medical team aboard the recovery ship New Orleans, told ABC News in Honolulu. I'd say their condition is, uh, is good. They had a good breakfast this morning. Uh, they talked to members of the ship and uh, friends who came aboard when the ship docked. And uh, they walked off uh, under their own steam and said goodbye, uh, got in the car and drove up to the hospital. Uh, I would, uh, I would say it was good. Dr. Lapenta says the gas problem caused Vance Brand to pass out for about a minute during the Apollo's re-entry. Afternoon and time for CBS News. CBS News. From the Senate to the House, a bipartisan plea to reconsider. I'm Neil Strauser, substituting for Bernard Shaw and reporting on the CBS radio network. U.S. Air Force cargo plane, which would have brought the Apollo astronauts back to Houston, landed there today without them, but with some canisters which may provide a clue to the nature of the gas they inhaled on descent and which keeps them hospitalized in Honolulu for obser observation. They are the canisters which filter the cabin air, and they may have collected traces of the gas. NASA spokesman John McLeish says that it's still not known when the astronauts will return to Houston. To repeat, chest x-rays on Donald K. Slayton show no significant change from the last x-ray. There has been no progression of chest symptoms and eye and skin irritation has disappeared. The three Apollo crewmen will remain under observation in the Tripler Intensive Care Unit uh, through uh, this morning and uh, may be moved to private rooms today. A C-5A cargo plane, which would have taken the astronauts to a reunion with their wives, landed at Ellington Air Force Base near the Johnson Space Center this morning. Well, midnight. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Don Fisher, and at this hour, if the astronauts has improved, then they should be able to leave the hospital in a day or two. Thomas Stafford, Vance Brand, and Deke Slayton have been under observation at Tripler Army Hospital in Honolulu for lung irritation. The three had breathed toxic fumes during their return to Earth last Thursday. In Honolulu, correspondent Tom Shell tells us what's ahead for the astronauts. If they are released by Monday, as uh, seems to be the indication now, they would return to Houston and continue their debriefing from the mission. Uh, they still have considerable more testing to undergo here at the hospital, and of course a lot of the testing that they wanted to do, the medical testing the doctors wanted to do because of the space flight has been locked by now, I would imagine. 
but uh, they will be able to still give them uh, pretty thorough physical exams uh, in relation to the space flight. And correspondent Shell says the astronauts have now been taken out of the intensive care unit at the hospital. Five airmen killed in Michigan plane crash. That story coming up. CBS News. A bill extending the Voting Rights Act for another seven years has gone to the White House. It was just approved by the House. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network. Astronauts are going to get a 10-day holiday in Hawaii of sorts with their wives while they recuperate from the effects of mysterious fumes in the Apollo spacecraft. Officials here at the Johnson Space Center have identified fumes that have hospitalized the astronauts as potentially dangerous nitrogen tetroxide fumes, a fuel used by the spacecraft's steering rockets. ASTP technical director Glenn Lunny says the fumes entered the spacecraft for unknown reasons because two automatic earth landing system switches were not thrown in time and as the drogue chute deployed the steering rockets automatically began firing to stabilize the spacecraft the fumes from the rockets entered the cabin by an air equalization valve that is open during the re-entry phase it is not known how much of the gas entered the spacecraft but john young head of the astronauts office here credits tom stafford with quickly realizing the situation and throwing the appropriate switches to shut down the rockets eliminating the cause of the fumes